Okay, hi folks. So uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about call numbers and finding books. Um, we're going to focus specifically on using the library catalog, and I'm going to explain to you a little bit about how call numbers work so that you can figure out how to use them when you're actually in the library. And then I'm going to talk to you too about some ways to search for materials in the library catalog. So there are three major classification systems that libraries and librarians use to organize information. The first is the Dewey Decimal System, and that's used primarily by public libraries. This is the system that might be the most familiar to you if you've spent much time in your local public library. Um, it's a relatively simple system to use. In academic libraries, which is Rasmussen or the UAF library, we use a system called Library of Congress Classification System, and this is pretty standard in any academic library across the country. It's a slightly more complex system because academic libraries tend to have more specialized information than public libraries do. So, for instance, you might go to your public library to pick up, you know, a cookbook or a travel guide or some new fiction that you want to read, you'll probably use your academic library to do research, right? You might do research in biology and want to know about a very specific plant or genome or something like that. Um, or you might use the archives in an academic library and look at really specialized information there. So the Library of Congress classification system, um, you might also hear me call it LC or LOC for an abbreviation, but that system is a little bit more complex just because the nature of the materials that need to be classified and cataloged are more complex. And this is the system that you'll deal with the most in this class because we're focused on research and how to use an academic library. And then last but not least, uh, the government has its own classification system for organizing documents that it produces. So anything from tax forms to reports it writes on natural disasters or the education system or anything else. Think about all the hundreds of thousands of documents that the government produces in a year. It has to organize that information somehow. And that system is called SUDOCS, and that's short for the Superintendent of Documents Classification System. Um, this is the first and last time we'll talk about that system, but what's really important for you to know is that there is a totally separate third system for how the government organizes its information. All right, so on this slide we'll talk about how to read a call number and how to break it down by its component parts. So Library of Congress call numbers always begin with a letter and then a combination of letters and numbers. The letters to the left of the decimal point describe the subject or the aboutness of the book or other library material. In this example, the letter D represents history. So if you're a history major, you know that all of your books will begin with the letter D and you can go straight to that section of the library. Because the subject matter of history is very big and broad, we use a second letter in order to be more descriptive or more specific. So in this case, the combination of DA represents British history. Next, we have numbers. In this example, 36 represents a time period. Uh, for instance, the year 1600 to 1650. So when we put DA36 together, we know that we have a book about British history from 1600 to 1650. The letter and numbers to the right of the decimal place represent the name of the author who wrote the book. Sometimes you'll see a year placed at the very end of a call number, so you might see DA36.A77-2012. That just uh, represents the year that the book was published, and we do that when we have several copies of the same book in the library. So being able to read call numbers is arguably more important than knowing what each letter and number represents. Uh, the way that you read numbers, or I'm sorry, the way that you read call numbers is you begin by reading in alphabetical order. For example, 
a call number that started with the letter D would be shelved ahead of a book that began with DA. The reason this is important to know is because when you're up in the stacks of a library looking for a book, you don't want to spend all your time wandering around. If you're in the D section, you want to know that you actually need to make your way a little bit further down to the DA section. Next, you'll read a call number in numeric order. So a call number of DA3 would be shelved ahead of DA36. And then lastly, you read the information to the right of the decimal place in alphanumeric order. So just like the information to the left of the decimal place. In this case, our call number has A77 to the right of the decimal. A77 would be shelved ahead of A8. And that can seem a little bit counterintuitive, but a good rule of thumb to remember is that all sevens come before eights, all eights come before nines, so on and so forth. So this slide just has a link out to the Library of Congress website, um, the page that shows you the letter that corresponds to each broad subject area. If you click on a letter that interests you, um, you'll see it, how it breaks it down even further. So you'll click on you know D for history, and then you'll get taken to a page that says D A D B D C and you can see what the specific subject breakdowns are. So if you're interested in that, just use this link and you can go take a look. The library catalog has three primary access points or three ways to search for library materials. These are by title, by author, or by subject. A search by title or author is, I think, pretty self-explanatory but I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking with you about the third access point, which is searching by subject. Subject refers to subject heading, and these describe the aboutness of a book or other library material. For example, the book Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone has 25 subject headings assigned to it, all of which describe a different aspect of the story. But it's important to know what exactly a subject search does and why it's helpful or why you should use it. So the simple answer to that is that subject searching casts a really wide but very accurate net. So if you use a subject search, the results that you get back are likely to be pretty relevant to whatever it is that you're researching. Um, because most academic libraries use the same subject headings or standard across all academic libraries, um, that means you can go into any academic library and find relevant information if you know what subject heading is related to your information need. So, in other words, you can use the UAF library, a library in your home state, a library where you're going on vacation, and if you know the subject headings related to your topic, you can plug those into their library catalog and find good, useful information. So. Uh, an example of this is, um, let's say you're doing research on poison pen letters. The relevant subject heading for that topic is actually anonymous letters. So once you know that, you can use any library um, and any library catalog and do a subject search for anonymous letters. And the catalog will show you every material that's been assigned that subject heading. And the way that subject headings get assigned is by librarians. So a book will come into the library, the librarian will look at the book, sometimes read it in its entirety, and then assign all the subject headings that she thinks are um, relevant to the content of that book. Um, so you might be wondering how subject headings are, or subject heading searches are different than just doing a keyword search. And if you remember, a keyword search is basically how we might search Google. So the difference is that a keyword search is less accurate. For example, if you did a keyword search for poison pen letters, you'd receive some relevant results, 
but those would be mixed in with results that are just about poison or just about letters or maybe even just about pens, um, but not actually about your specific research topic. So essentially using subject headings is the most accurate way to perform a search. So now that you have a basic idea of what a subject or a subject heading search is, you might be wondering how you figure out what a subject heading is, right? Because they're standard, we know we don't make them up. They are predetermined for us, so we need to figure out which ones are relevant to whatever it is that we're researching. There are two good ways to find relevant subject headings that you can then plug in to a search in the library catalog. So one way to do it is to go to the Library of Congress website, which is linked on this slide, and do a keyword search for your topic. So for instance, you might type in dogs, and the Library of Congress will show you a list of subject headings related to dogs that are standardized. And then you can pick the one that's most helpful to you or most accurate to your research topic, plug that into the library catalog, and perform a subject heading search. The second way to find relevant subject headings is to look at a book or an article that you have already found that you think is helpful to your research and look at the subject headings that have been assigned to that material. If there are one or two or three that are relevant to your research, you can plug those into the library catalog and find everything else that's been tagged with that subject heading. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more about subject headings and how to use them, I just want to very briefly cover um, where you'll find them and like what types of materials you'll find them assigned to and who uses them. So any material you find in a library will have at least one subject heading assigned to it. Usually there are multiple subject headings. So if you think about what you'd find in a library, whether it's books, films, archival materials, anything like that will have subject headings. Um, government documents are a thing that you can find in academic libraries. Those have a separate subject heading system called SUDOCs, which we covered earlier. We won't use those in this class, so you don't need to worry about them. It's just good to be aware that it's a different system. Um, and then there are a couple fields or disciplines that also have their own set of subject headings. So education uses something called ERIC descriptors. Psychology uses the psychological index of terms. And then medical journals or really any discipline that can be um, folded into like the health sciences is going to use a system called MeSH. Uh, we won't do anything specifically with these in this class, but if you're researching a topic in one of these fields, just be aware that you may have to use a slightly different set of subject headings. All right, so a few slides earlier, I told you that the library catalog has three access points. Um, author, title, and subject. This is just a screenshot of the advanced search page in the Rasmussen Library Catalog, and you can see that subject is one of the areas you can go in and search. I want to also point out that that very first line that says TX, all text, is the same thing as a keyword search. They've just, whoever built the catalog just decided to call it all text instead of keyword searching. Um, but you can use that in addition to the three main access points, right, which are author, title, and subject terms. You can use the all text search to do a keyword or key phrase search, and um, that'll cast a really wide net. So the main difference between subject terms and keyword searching is that subject terms are really specific, and when you search for a subject term, you're only going to retrieve back items that have been assigned that subject term. When you do a keyword or a key phrase search, it's less specific, um, and you're going to retrieve back any item that has the phrase or the word that you used in its title, in the summary of the item, um, in the cataloging record. So anywhere that word shows up, if you search for it, you'll get that material back. So it's a much less specific type of searching than a subject term search is.
Okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit here and move away from subject headings and into Boolean operators. So in this class, you'll use three Boolean operators in your searching, and they are AND, OR, and NOT. Um, and essentially, you'll use these to customize the type of results that you get back when you do a keyword search. So the way that you use Boolean operators is the same way you would use AND, OR, and NOT in a sentence. So AND connects keywords together and it narrows down a search. So you could search for dogs and diet and the results you would get back would be about the best types of diets for dogs. AND basically tells the library catalog that it can only bring you back results that list both of your keywords. OR does the opposite. It makes a search bigger um, and it brings back one of your keywords or the other one or both together. So if you're searching for instance for dogs or canines, that tells the catalog bring me back articles or books that list the word dogs, but also bring me back articles or books that list the word canines and then also bring me back those materials that list both together. This way you can, by using OR, you cast a really wide net so you have a better chance of seeing everything that's out there on your topic. And then finally there's NOT, which is probably the easiest one to get a hang of. It excludes a topic. So, um, and by excluding a topic it, it narrows down a search. So you might search for dogs, not poodles, and all of your results that you would get back would be about all different types of dogs, but it wouldn't include anything about poodles.